Well, thank you all for joining us for the Bay Area Older Adults Joseph D. Grant County Park Program in partnership with Valley Water. So you know what this means. They're going to be quiz questions to determine what you learned from the program. So be prepared. Okay, so for those of us, those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Ann Ferguson, and I'm Executive Director of Bay Area Older Adults, which I'll call BAO for short. BAO is a nonprofit organization that improves the health and well-being of more than 42,000 adults age 50 plus each year. We trek on nature trails, learn about different cultures, explore historic sites, experience new culinary flavors, and help connect you to people with shared interests. Since 2013, we've taken more than 4,600 seniors who've walked more than 14,000 miles and more than 35 parks. And these are some of the photos from our walks as long, along with our website address. So the first thing I'd like to know is, have you ever been to Joseph D. Grant County Park that's located near the top of Mount Hamilton in San Jose? All right, so it looks like most people have not been to the park. So for those of you who haven't been there before, which is everyone on the call, the main park entrance is located at 18. 405 Mount Hamilton Road in San Jose. You would get there by taking either Highway 101 or Highway 680 and exiting at Alum Rock Avenue heading east. In a mile or so, you're going to make a right onto Mount Hamilton Road. And if you've ever been on Mount Hamilton Road before, you know that it's a steep, windy road with very little shoulder. You travel on that windy road for almost eight miles. And on the right side is the main entrance that has many parking lots, picnic tables, and restrooms. Just a little further up the road on the left side is a small parking lot that is nearby Grant Lake, and it has a porta potty. The two sides of the road allow you to access two different sets of trails. Today, we're going to take a four-mile walk at Joseph D. Grant Park that takes us to three lakes, Bass Lake, McCreary Lake, and Grant Lake, and along some creeks. Before we go on our walk today, I want to teach you about the San Felipe Creek Project that was completed in 2018 by a group of agencies, one of which is Valley Water. San Felipe Creek is a 14-mile stream that's shown here in red that originates just west of Joseph D. Grant County Park and descends east and south into the park through Halls Valley. If you take a walk on the hotel or corral trails, you will see the creek. It's one of the nine major tributaries of Coyote Creek and is an important part of the Coyote Creek watershed. The San Felipe Creek Restoration Project was undertaken due to the damage caused by ranchos that were built on the land dating back to 1839 by the Spanish and to deal with the impacts of climate change. Climate change has increased temperatures in the Bay Area, which causes larger atmospheric rivers, which means more severe rainstorms and more frequent flooding of rivers, reservoirs, and creeks, such as San Felipe Creek. The project focused on restoring approximately one mile of San Felipe Creek and the surrounding area. There were five main project goals. First, they had to stabilize the creek to prevent flooding of the nearby wildlife habitats. 
In order to do this, they had to reconnect the creek to floodplains. What does this mean exactly? A floodplain is a large surface area of low-lying ground adjacent to a river. If floodplains are connected to rivers and creeks, they can hold water when the riverbanks overflow by soaking up the water like a sponge. And you can see an example in this image. This prevents floodwaters from causing too much damage. When water overflows onto the floodplain, not only does it prevent flooding, but the water on and what seeps underground the floodplain recharges our groundwater supply. Another function of the floodplain is to prevent wildlife habitat from being destroyed by flooding. In summary, floodplains can prevent flooding damage to wildlife habitats and recharge our groundwater supply. So how did they reconnect the floodplain to San Felipe Creek? First, they cut a wider path for the creek. Then they created an inset floodplain, which is a bench at an elevation above the creek channel bed, but below the floodplain. It basically looks like a step down from the floodplain. The inset or bench catches and removes sediment and other pollutants from the creek that are harmful to wildlife and prevents erosion of the creek bed as the water levels rise. They also fixed eroded sections of the creek channel by adding vegetation, specifically native plants, along the channel to stabilize it structurally. A second project goal was to increase biodiversity by planting native flora and removing weeds in the area near and surrounding the creek to provide habitat for endangered wildlife, such as the California red-legged frog and tiger salamander, shown here. A third project goal was to restore the seasonal wetland habitat created by the floodplain. So why are wetlands so important? As I mentioned, they are flood busters. They act like a sponge to soak up floodwaters. And again, they're also important for groundwater recharge, which is important for our water supply. Seasonal wetlands also provide an important food source for migratory songbirds and waterfowl. They provide breeding and feeding areas for amphibians and reptiles, and critical winter food supplies for wild turkeys, deer, and other birds and mammals. Since wetlands have a high density of plant life, they can soak up carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through photosynthesis. The carbon is stored for thousands of years in vegetation and other organic matter. Last but not least, they act as a water filter to remove pollutants such as sediment and nitrates. Since this area was used for ranching, cows graze this land for more than 180 years and continue to do so, which means they track through the wetlands in search of plants to eat and destroy habitat along the way. In addition, there are wild boars who eat anything and everything. They destroy the habitat by digging up the dirt in search of plant roots, nuts, seeds, fruit, 
rodents, and small reptiles. In order to restore the seasonal wetlands, fencing was installed to exclude pigs and cattle. Now that we learned a little about the San Felipe Creek Restoration Project, let's take a two-question quiz to test what we learned so far. The first question is, which of these choices is not part of the San Felipe Creek Restoration Project? Okay, so everyone got the question correct. The correct answer is relocating tiger salamanders is not part of the San Felipe Creek Restoration Project. The next question is, why are seasonal wetlands so important? Right, everyone got that second question correct as well. It is all of the above. So today we're gonna travel on four miles of trails that take us to three lakes to hear the birds playing in the oak trees and drinking the lake water. We discover some unexpected things in the park along the way. Joseph D. Grant County Park is located at the base of Mount Hamilton. Its 9,500 acres of land has history dating back to 1839, when the Spanish gave the land to Governor Alvarado. In the 1880s, the Grant family began to acquire different pieces of the land and started to build many, now historic, structures. For instance, at the Grant Trailhead where we are starting our walk, there are two historic structures, ranch and cookhouse. After the death of Joseph Grant and his wife Edith, the ranch was left to their children and bought by their daughter, Josephine Grant McCreary. She resided there until 1972. Josephine willed half of the ranch to save the Redwoods League and half to the Menninger Foundation. Both organizations sold their portion of the ranch in 1975 to the County of Santa Clara. Joseph D. Grant Park was dedicated and opened to the public in 1978. This is why the park is named after Joseph D. Grant and some trail names are named after his family and historic structures located near trails. Another interesting fact about Grant was that he was a founding member of the Save the Redwoods League. We begin our walk on the wide, flat hotel trail. Can you hear the chorus of northern flickers, woodpecker drumming, chestnut-backed chickadees, white-breasted nuthatches, and oak titmouses that are bustling in the trees and shrubs? These birds nest in the cavities of the trees and eat insects. Along the trail, there are bushes and small trees of different sizes and shapes, such as coyote bush, cherry plum, coffee berry, holly leaf cherry, and sage. The colors they display are pale yellow and green and dark green. The ones with berries supply food for the local birds. The hills of this park are studded with five types of oak trees, valley oak, blue and black oak, coast live oak, and canyon live oak, that provide habitat and food for more than 32 species of birds and 39 species of mammals. 
The most common way to distinguish among different western oaks is to look carefully at their leaves, and if it is the fall season, then you can observe their acorns. Oak leaves vary by whether they have lobes or not, and what is the shape of their lobes. For instance, canyon and interior live oaks and tan oak leaves do not have lobes. We bear left onto a narrower trail called the Loop Trail that takes us to the first lake called Bass Lake. We spot some acorn woodpeckers flying onto and out of a valley oak tree and pecking on a thick branch. These woodpeckers have a bright red cap, but so do pileated, red-headed, red-bellied, and hairy woodpeckers, so you need to look further to identify them. They are black above, with a black mask across their eyes and side of their face and around their beak, but bright white on their forehead and cheeks. Their belly is white with black stripes. Looking closely at the tree, we can see rows of holes in the branches indicating where the woodpeckers found its food. Woodpecker tongues are commonly covered with barbs or sticky saliva that are long enough to find ants and insect larvae deep in the wood crevices. Their tongue is so long it is stored by being curled around the back of its head between its skull and skin. We see large clumps of vegetation in the oak trees hanging from the bare branches. The trees are infested with oak mistletoe, a parasitic plant that is transferred from tree to tree by birds that feed on its berries. Mistletoe sends out thread-like strands into branches, tapping the tree's nutrients and water to survive. Too many mistletoe growths starve the tree of nutrients and water, and it becomes unhealthy and will eventually die. We pass a large California buckeye, or horse chestnut tree, that has many ornaments hanging from its branches. These are their nuts, which are unpleasant tasting and contain the toxin used for rat poison. Native insects such as the orange tortrix, polyphemus, and speckled green fruitworm moth are attracted to buckeye flowers because they eat the nectar. We turn right onto the Bass Lake Trail, and just 50 steps further, we see Bass Lake. This is exciting! There are all kinds of birds drinking and eating at Bass Lake. Across the lake from where we are, we see three bright-colored male birds sitting next to each other on a dead tree branch overhanging the water. They are tilting their bodies down to drink water and then back up again every second or so. These western bluebirds are stocky birds with a shiny blue head, throat, wings, and tail, a bright rust orange breast and upper back, and a great white belly. Bluebirds are social and usually hunt for insects and feed on berries in groups. A female flies in to join them on the branch. Not far away, on another branch overhanging the water, we see an acorn woodpecker drinking water from the lake. Their bright red cap and black mask that contrasts their white throat and forehead is clearly visible. More acorn woodpeckers fly in from a nearby tree to join him.
After they are done drinking, they fly back to the tree, peck the wood, and eat the insects, and then fly back down for a drink. This behavior is repeated over and over. Looking into the sky, we spot a red-tailed hawk soaring in the clear blue sky. They are one of the largest birds in North America. They have broad, rounded wings with a span of up to 52 inches and a short, wide tail. Their feather coloration varies, but generally they are rich brown above and pale below with streaks of brown on their belly. Their eye color changes from pale yellow to brown as they age. With their sharp vision, they can see their prey, such as squirrels, mice, and rabbits, from 100 feet in the air and dive at up to 125 miles per hour to catch it. Hawks live an average of 20 years and do not begin breeding until they are three years old. Their nests are found up to 75 feet high in forks of large trees. This is where they lay two to four eggs, which hatch within 30 days. We continue on the loop trail to go to McCreary Lake that is double the size of Bass Lake. This lake was named after the daughter of Joseph D. Grant, who married into the McCreary family. Across the lake, a greater yellowlegs is wading in the water and bobbing its head up and down into the mud to hunt for aquatic insects, small fish, and marine worms. It is a large, lanky shorebird with a long bill. Its back and wings are a checkerboard of white and brown with a light-colored breast and long, bright yellow legs. It migrates here from Canada and Mexico. We also see a sooty black Phoebe perched on a branch who is looking for its afternoon insect snack. On the left side of the lake, we see disrupted foliage and soil, which is evidence of wild boar foraging. Boars have a well-developed sense of smell. They use their long, strong snouts to dig up the ground, or what is called root the soil, as they search for food such as nuts, acorns, roots, bulbs, insects, and worms. Female wild boars are social and live in groups of other females and their offspring. These groups are called sounders. They communicate using growls for aggression and squeals for approachability. We travel south on two more trails with shrubs on either side of the trail, then crossing a bridge and along a creek that has bright green algae growing at the bottom and floating on the top. Along the way, we see native plants and wildflowers and views of the surrounding area. The first wildflower that greets us is a cluster of deep blue petaled flowers with white appendages at its center and long stalked leaves at the base of the plant. This flower is called Pacific Hound's Tongue. It got its common name from the shape of its leaves. Native Americans use preparations from the root of this plant to treat burns and stomach aches. Next we see milkmaids that have four white petals with pale pink veins and bright yellow anthers projecting from its center. It is one of the first flowers to bloom in the Bay Area. Milkmaids are a host plant for Sarah's orange-tipped butterflies 
named for their bright orange wingtips. We pass by a tree with a four foot diameter trunk and a one foot diameter gall growing on the side of its trunk. Galls are abnormal swellings or tumors caused by rapidly dividing plant cells. The growth can be a reaction to insects, bacteria, fungi, mechanical injury, or genetic mutation. They can occur on any part of a plant, leaves, branches, roots, trunks, and even flower petals. This yellow native flower is the California buttercup. It has more than a dozen overlapping glossy yellow petals. The flower is edible and they are the host plant for three different species of moth. On the side of the trail we find a cow vertebra from the lower spine that is 10 inches wide and 6 inches tall. Our parks allow cattle to graze in the grasslands as a means to prevent wild fires. Their most common predators are a band of coyotes and mountain lions. This shooting star has four narrow lavender petals that are at the top of a very thin, long, and brown stem. Along the Yerba Buena Trail, we have views of Mount Hamilton that has a peak of more than 4,200 feet and Lake Astronomical Observatory that is owned and operated by the University of California. The observatory was built in 1887 and now houses a 120 inch reflector telescope. From the top of the Lakeview Trail, not only can we view Grant Lake, but also Cook House. In 1932, Joseph D. Grant made extensive renovations to the Cook House that included adding two new wings to the structure, building a swimming pool and pool house, adding a second floor balcony, and more. The Cook House later became the park office and is currently undergoing restoration. Along the Lakeview Trail, we find more wildflowers. Orange flowered fiddlenecks are commonly used for erosion control and habitat restoration. Its prickly fruit gets attached to animal fur or human socks, helping to spread its seeds. Fiddleneck flowers are tubular with five petals. Their flower buds are in tight coils at the top of the plant. The flowers open from the bottom to the top, causing the stem to uncoil. Thus, they got their common name because the stem is curved like the neck of a fiddle and the flowers coming off the stem seem like tuning pegs. On the right side of the trail is a five foot tall shrub called hillside gooseberry. Hanging upside down from its thin dark brown branches are cranberry red berries with bristles. Their berries are edible and provide food for birds and caterpillars. Its flowers also hang upside down. This bush has deep green shiny leaves that are rounded and lobed. We arrive at our final destination, Grant Lake, that is home to waterfowl and other birds, reptiles, and more. Along the side of the lake among water plants are a bale of turtles with their necks up in the air surveying the water. These slider turtle shells and skin are olive to brown in color with yellow stripes. Unfortunately, they were pet turtles introduced into the wild by owners who no longer wanted them and are considered an aggressive invasive species taking over the habitat for California's only freshwater turtle, the western pond turtle, that is a species of special concern. In the tall weeds by the lake is a light gray bird sitting on one of the fragile branches looking for insects to eat. It has a white eye ring, white tipped wings, and is lighter gray on its belly. It blends in perfectly with the reeds and is easy to miss. 
Tree swallows are flying above Grant Lake. Adult males are colorful blue-green above and white below with gray-black wings and a thin black eye mask. They breed in open habitats such as fields and wetlands, usually near water. They feed on small aerial insects that they catch in their mouths during acrobatic flight. So I want to thank Valley Water for supporting this virtual program. As I mentioned earlier, as part of the reporting for the Valley Water grant that supports this program, we have one last question. Please rate your satisfaction with today's program on a scale from very satisfied to very unsatisfied. I want to remind you that this presentation and other park tours are available at BAO's webpage. That's www.bayareaolderadults.org front slash videos. If you know anyone else who would appreciate this video, feel free to share this link with them.